Good evening, everyone. It's seven o'clock, May 24th. Thanks for coming to tonight's webinar uh, with Chloe Wright uh, from UBC Okanagan. Uh, the webinar series was essentially created to get some science and information out in front of our members and members of the public uh, related to questions they have around the sustainability of fish and wildlife. Um, it's been going on for, I guess, better than a year and a half now. Uh, been very uh, exciting and, and is, you know, an honor to help engage with everyone and get to watch all of this stuff too. Uh, the format for tonight is the same as every other night. Uh, Chloe's going to speak for probably 30 to 45 minutes. We'll go into Q&A. If you have a question, put it in the Q&A box. If you're in on Zoom, if you're in on Facebook Live, please put it in the comment section. Uh, we'll kind of aggregate the questions and put them in thematically, and then Chloe will give us answers. Uh, but not to all the questions, because she's a scientist and not a politician. So if there's things that really make your blood boil, uh, and it's a policy question, we may not be able to answer it. Uh, and if you feel like there's changes that are needed, please feel free to pick up a pen and paper or get on your keyboard and send a note to your uh, MLA. Uh, so that's kind of the intro and how things work. Uh, Chloe's been on, I think this is her third time, so she gets a green jacket here fairly shortly. Uh, she's been working on her PhD for four years now? Closer to five, but don't Closer tell Closer to five. Idea. Okay, and, and we're shooting for October, I think, was, yeah, we're shooting for October to be done. I know she's submitted a couple of papers, she's done a few chapters. Uh, tonight, she's going to talk about survival and movement. Um, but for a bunch of people who haven't seen the other webinars, I think she's going to give you a really quick recap of what happened uh, in the past and just some high level data from the project. So Chloe's background, she has an undergrad in biology from University of Florida. She worked just three and a half years uh, as a research technician studying white tailed deer, black bears, coyotes, wolves, bobcats throughout Midwestern USA. She has a master's uh, in science from the University of Montana on white-tailed deer survival and resource selection. And she's now a PhD candidate and hopefully a PhD done here in a few months. So uh, Chloe, uh, if you wanna share your screen, I'll turn it over to you and uh, really appreciate your time tonight. Yeah, thanks, Jesse. Um, okay, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, Looks so good. Yes. Okay, uh, I will just get right into it because um, it's kind of a long one. Um, yeah, so thank you all so much uh, for tuning in tonight and for um, caring about this research. Uh, it, this is part of my PhD, and I'm going to be talking about how habitat use impacts mule deer survival in South Central British Columbia. And as always, before I start, I'd really just like to acknowledge that this work um, is not done just by me, and it's not done just by UBC. We have some really important project partners that I think um, I need to mention before we start. And so these include the British Columbia Ministry of Forests, um, the Okanagan Nations Alliance, uh, the BC Wildlife Federation, the University of Idaho, and the Bonaparte Indian Band. And so just a brief outline, um, if this is your first time learning about SimDeer, I recommend that you watch some other presentations that are on the BCWF website. Like Jesse mentioned, this is my third webinar, and I think it was the first one where I really delved deeply into the project and what we do and how. So um, yeah, so if you uh, want more background information, you can check those out. Um, and then, so I'll just start with, again, just a really brief introduction to the project, some background on how disturbances can impact survival, and I'll talk about the study areas quick field methods, a capture and survival update from this last year, and then I'll really get into the stuff that I think everyone is excited about, at least I am, and that's about how habitat use um, impacts survival, so about how I did this and then some results. And so again, if you have seen one of these presentations before, feel free to you know, go get a drink, go get some dinner halfway through and then come back uh, closer to the end um, where I get into this more exciting stuff. And um, yeah, just as a warning, there's a lot of pictures of dead deer, especially in the latter half of this presentation. So if you're squeamish and you don't like seeing pictures of dead animals, um, yeah, maybe just close your eyes and just listen to me uh, talk. Okay. Um, so mule deer are in decline in certain parts of British Columbia, and some of these declines date back to the 1950s, but some we really saw the major decline between the 1990s and the early 2000s. And in some regions, these populations stabilized at a low level, but in other regions, we think these population declines are continuing. But unfortunately, there's been really limited research done to determine why this might be the case. And the main reason behind this lack of research is largely minimal funding for this type of work in British Columbia, especially when compared to many Western states. 
Um, but luckily in 2018, a group of hunters and First Nations and just people from the public came together and said, we really want to understand what's going on with mule deer in BC. And so the Sim Deer Project or the Southern Interior Mule Deer Project was started. Um, and the project has two main goals. Um, the first being to use an evidence-based and co cooperative approach to determine um, which factors are limiting mule deer populations here in BC. And the second was to determine or to provide some management recommendations that might increase mule deer survival. And it turns out actually that determining limiting factors for mule deer is really difficult. As I've mentioned in other presentations, they're incredibly complex and interrelated. And so the, the best studies that are done that give the most informative results in, term, in terms of what factors are limiting mule deer populations are those that are ex either extremely long term. So in California, they studied mule deer survival for 12 continuous years, and it was only after 12 years of um, research that they found out that it was really the nutritional condition of females that had the largest impact on population growth. And so they could be long term or there are studies that um, are experimental manipulations. So in Colorado in the early 2000s, they had two different populations of deer that were similar in a bunch of different ways, except in one study area, they fed deer over the winter and in the study area, other study area, they did nothing. And then they saw a really large increase in population growth in those fed deer and then determined again that it was really nutrition that was limiting those deer. And then another important and um, often cited uh, manipulation that was done was in Idaho in, again, the early 2000s, in which they decreased coyote and cougar densities as much as humanly possible in one study area, compared it to a control area, and they saw no increase in population growth. And so perhaps one of the things that really ties these different studies together that actually get to these main limiting factors is that they contain some information about the predator community, and then in areas where there were lots of competitors, studies have had to also include information about competitors. And so knowing that we... Um, you know, at the beginning of a study, you can't just start out and have a, have a 12 year long study, right? We're in year five, we're working towards having a long term study. Um, so that we're working on, but experimental manipulations can be really difficult and expensive to get started. And so with all those things in mind, that's where the SimDeer project came from. And that's where we decided to use um, uh, remote camera data, as well as GPS collar data, and make these work together so that we could get um, information about the predators um, from the cameras and then information about the deer from the collared deer, and then kind of get a more complete picture of what's going on with mule deer in BC. Um, and so this is great. And I think moving forward, um, we will really see the results um, and some amazing, really cool results come out of this collaboration. Um, but unfortunately for my PhD work specifically, um, the camera work is just a little bit behind where I am right now. That's led by the amazing Sam Foster at the University of Idaho, um, but he started bef after me. Um, and then also, you know, that um, those photos, there were like a million, no, two, three million of those photos. And that data takes a really long time to work through. And so we're kind of working on two different time frames. So for my PhD specifically, all I was going to have, I realized, um, was collared mule deer and mortality investigation data, and none really of the camera data, um, just for my PhD. And so then I had to think to myself, how could I determine limiting factors, or how could I provide management recommendations um, with just these two pieces of information? Um, and it's because it's really difficult to determine the ultimate cause of death when this is all you have. So you guys know by now that cougars are the, um, the main source of mortality for mule deer in these regions, um, but that doesn't really tell us if that's because there's too many cougars on the landscape or more than there used to be, or if it's because something has changed on the landscape and made um, deer more susceptible to cougar predation. And so knowing these things and still wanting to provide management recommendations, I decided to ask the question of how does habitat use impact survival? And so in this way, I could use that GPS location data as well as the survival status of the animal to try to um, come up with or find um, habitats that mule deer use shortly before they die that either increase or decrease their relative risk of mortality. And then I could provide some management recommendations from this. And I think part of the reason this is such also an interesting question to ask is because there has been a lot of change in the habitat in southern BC in the last 50 years. 
And so one of these main um, things that have changed on the landscape is timber harvesting. Um, and so timber is a really valuable economic resource here in British Columbia. And so it gets extracted out of the landscape in really large chunks um, that we call cut blocks. And these cut blocks can actually create valuable habitat for deer, especially within the first five to 25 years post cut. Um, because once you remove um, the canopy, it allows for growth of early successional forage that is really good for mule deer. Um, and so we could see how these cut blocks could be beneficial on their summer range, uh, but what happens on their winter range? Because now you've removed that canopy, um, which is also has an important feature of snow interception. So without the canopy, snow depths are often much deeper in cut blocks compared to non-cut areas. And deep snow can be really energetically expensive for deer to move through. And so we could see how this might negatively impact their survival. And just to give you an idea of the spatial and temporal scale of harvest, timber harvest in BC, um, this is Google Earth imagery starting in 1985 and ending in 2020. And you can see just how many cuts have been made. Yeah, so along with these cut blocks, um, the forestry companies have to build roads to access the wood. And these roads are um, don't really pose much of a vehicle collision threat to deer because people generally don't drive very fast on them. But it turns out that predators really like to use these roads. And um, these roads allow predators to access areas that they couldn't access before or allows them to move faster and more efficiently um, on roads compared to non-roaded areas. And so in British Columbia, we have approximately 720,000 kilometers of, un, um, of roads, uh, with more than 90% of these being unpaved. And then um, because timber is so economically valuable here, we have done a great job at suppressing forest fires. And what happens when, when you suppress forest fires is you get um, a large buildup of deadfall, leaf litter, and brush. And then this dry understory can cause really large high intensity fires to occur when a fire does occur. And generally it's thought that these fires are still good for deer because again, you're removing that canopy and you're promoting the growth of early successional forage. But it's also possible that these fires could burn too hot and be destructive and remove really essential forage and hiding cover that deer rely on, especially in the winter. And so this just gives you an idea of how well we have suppressed forest fires here in BC. So this figure shows burn scars on tree ring sequences that date back all the way to the 1500s. Um, and then you can see there are these burn scars up until about 1950. And then between 1950 and 2000, you can really see that we've eradicated um, fire from the landscape. And then partly in result of that, you guys know all too well that we've had some really catastrophic fire seasons in the last few years. And so when I first moved to British Columbia, I didn't know any of this. And I recently gave a talk in Arizona about this work. And I think when people heard that I was from British Columbia, I think these are the, the um, habitats they had in mind. And I think when this is what you think of BC, it might be hard to believe that mule deer are in decline, right? This looks beautiful. And of course, this habitat does exist in BC, um, but most of BC looks kind of like this, right? And these are the different types of habitats that mule deer are now trying to navigate when previously they might have lived in a completely different landscape. And so then it's our job to try to understand how these different disturbances might impact mule deer survival. So um, the Simdeer project has three different study areas, the Cache Creek, West Okanagan, and Boundary regions. And then within each of these th three study areas, our goal was to GPS collar um, 30 adults per study area per year, or have that many collared per year, I should say, not recolor them. So maintain a sample size of 30, 30. and then for the juveniles, that included um, six-month-old fawns as well as neonates, and we've had to recatch those each year. Um, the neonates only really existed in two years of the project, um, but for all years of the project, we've also had the, those six-month-old fawns. And so originally, we were only supposed to operate between 2018 and 2021, um, but then there was such support and interest, I think, in the project that we have kept it going the last two winters, and then there's hope and I I think uh, a really good possibility that this project will continue into the future as well. So we GPS collar the adults and the six month old fawns using um, uh, helicopter net gunning, dark gunning, and clover trapping. And then for the neonates, we use doe locations in the um, in early June to look for these really characteristic clusters that form when deer give birth. And then we look for these clusters, we grid search them, and then we find the neonate. 
And then we do a bunch of things to the deer once we have them in hand, but the most important thing we do, especially for my research, is put a GPS collar on them. So the adults get the biggest one, they weigh 650 grams, they take a location every four hours and 15 minutes, um, and yeah, they last for, well, like four or five years. Some of them have had a last really long time. Then the juveniles get a slightly different collar. It just weighs a little bit less. It has less battery life, but you can see it expands up there at the top. Um, and uh, yeah, it weighs a little bit less. And then the neonates get quite a different collar. Um, it weighs only 140 grams and it does still take GPS uh, locations, but um, importantly, it grows with the neck of the deer. And so it has these folded pleats that as the, um, as the deer's neck grows, those pleats come out and then the elastic stretches until the um, until it eventually falls off the deer. And so um, all of those collars also give us notifications when the collar has been stationary between four and six hours. Um, and so that means that the deer is likely dead. And then we also have the location of where it probably died. So then we try to get to that site as quickly as possible um, so that we can try to determine what might have killed that deer. So in um, previous years, we caught a total of 384 deer, and um, with this year's captures, we're up to a total capture of 473 um, adults and six-month-old funds. So that's quite an impressive sample. Um, you can see that in uh, this year, um, we did not collar uh, any adults, really, um, and that's because we had enough adults collared in each um, study area, so there wasn't any need to recollar them or collar more. Um, and then for fawns, you'll notice that we collared close to 30 fawns in each study area this past winter. And that's because we're trying to catch more deer moving forward so that we can get a better idea of this um, annual variability that seems to exist in fawn uh, over winter survival. And then for neonates, this information hasn't changed in the last couple of presentations. The first year was just a, um, a pilot study, and then spring 2020 and 2021, our goal was to catch 20 neonates in each study area, and you can see that we did that. And so right now, we currently have 188 deer that are collared. You can see that in each study area, we have more than 30 adults collared. Um, there's a couple yearlings left over from last year, and then also a couple fawns um, that will soon age up to yearlings uh, at the end of this month. But those are the fawns left over from, um, from this year's capture. So then for adult survival, um, this is all of the years combined in the boundary region. Um, and the reason I combined all the years for adult survival is because it actually really didn't change much between years. And so this figure starts on um, April 1st and goes until March 31st. And you can see how um, survival is declining over time. So for um, adults in the boundary, their annual adult survival is about um, 0.77. In the West Okanagan, it's 0.85. Excuse me, and then in Cache Creek, it's also 0.85. And so what we can see from this uh, is that survival of adults in the boundary is quite low, especially compared to the Okanagan and Cache Creek. And it actually turns out when you compare these numbers to um, those in the literature from similar regions, this adult survival of 0.77 in the boundary is really concerning and likely is indicative of a population that's in decline in the boundary. And then, um, so this is overwinter fawn survival all of the years combined, so 2018 until uh, yesterday when I made this figure. Uh, so it's all the years combined, and you can see on average, um, overwinter fawn survival is uh, 0.61 in the boundary. It's 0.59 in the Okanagan, and it's 0.64 in Cache Creek. And you can see these numbers are all really similar. And in fact, when we compare these to other regions, we can see that these are kind of average for overwinter fawn survivals. And so there's really nothing concerning when you pull them all together. But I think what's interesting is that when you break them apart by year, there does seem to be some important um, interannual variation. So this is this this past winter, December of 2022 until May of 2023. Um, and in the boundary, we can see that survival was about 0.55, which again is pretty close to that 0.6. So nothing really concerning there. Uh, but then when we look at the Okanagan this past winter, overwinter fawn survival was 0 0.43. And that's quite a bit lower than the 0.65 or the 0.6 on average. And then um, in Cache Creek, again, it was pretty average. So this just shows again in Cache Creek, or excuse me, in the Okanagan this past winter, for some reason, they um, fawns had a much harder time surviving than in the other two study areas and when we compare it um, overall. 
And it's not just the Okanagan that struggles sometimes. So this is the first year of the project. This is December 2018 to May of 2019. And you can see in the boundary this year, our overwinter pond survival was 0 0.32, which is much lower than the 0.6 or 0.65 on average. Um, but that year it was totally average um, in the West Okanagan. So these two slides were really just to highlight that variability that seems to occur between years for fawns. And I think why it's so important that we keep um, studying their survival moving forward, because these changes between years could have really big impacts on population growth. And then um, for neonate survival, so this is from the day they were born until they were 12 weeks of age, we can see neonate survival is 0.46 in the boundary. Again, this is all the years combined. In the Okanagan, it's 0.48, and in Cache Creek, it's 0.38. And these numbers do seem concerning, right, because this is the number, this is the proportion of deer um, from the day they're born until they make it to 12 weeks old, you're losing about half of your deer. Um, but it turns out that these numbers are actually what we see in a lot of different places, and it's probably the reason why mule deer give birth to twins. They know that one of those deer is probably going to not make it out of the summer and then hopefully the other one can survive um, to be recruited to the population. So then um, no surprise here, I've talked about this before, for adult fawn mortality sources, cougar predation is still our number one um, source of mortality, um, but their uh, coyotes are going up there. So we actually saw a decent number of coyote predation in the Okanagan region this winter. Um, you can see a handful of wolves as well. Those were mostly in um, the Calf Creek region and then a couple of bears and bobcats and things like that. Um, but it's not just predators that kill deer. Um, so we have some unknowns. Um, those are just deer. When you get there, there's not much left, so it's hard to tell. Uh, some vehicle collision accidents. Um, I will mention that the three licensed harvests were all deer that were caught as males, as fawns, and then were still collared their first, um, that first fall. Um, or it would have been their second fall, but anyways, then they would have been harvested during any buck season. And then for neonates, again, this um, figure hasn't changed. Um, yeah, most of our neonate mortalities were unknown just because they're really small and they get eaten really fast. Um, and so that leaves not much behind. But otherwise, bears were the number one source that we could identify for neonates. OK, so that's a lot of information about the deer that are dying and what their mortality rates are. And I told you sort of what's killing them, cougars, but why are cougars killing these deer? What is it about the landscape or the, um, yeah, that's making deer more susceptible to cougar predation? And so that's why we asked that question of how does habitat use impact survival? So to answer this question, um, I used a couple sources of data, the main one being our GPS collar locations from all those deer. And then I also used remotely sensed or satellite habitat data. So I didn't go out and measure any um, sort of feature on the ground. I didn't go do veg surveys or anything like that. We just simply don't have the money or the time for that at this time. Um, so yeah, so I used remotely sensed data. And then I, of course, included um, whether or not an, a deer lived or died. And then I divided my GPS locations up by both age, class, and season. And this is because we know the things that um, impact mule deer survival differs between adults and fawns. And then it's also different um, in the winter versus in the summer. So it felt important to break it out in those um, different ways. And then I extracted environmental variables to those location data. So the environmental variables I included were um, things about the different disturbances that I described in the introduction, right? So the roads that are out there, um, the couple lock age groups, young, medium, and old, and then also burn age groups um, from wildfire burns. And then we also know from a ton of previous work that um, weather, especially in the winter, but even now it's coming out that late, um, late summer weather can also impact mule deer survival. Survival. And so I wanted to make sure that I included these variables in these models so as not to disregard something that could actually have a really large impact on mule deer survival. So I included um, some data on winter snow depth, uh, mean daily maximum temperatures, and then also summer precipitation. And if you've never used or seen um, this remotely sensed data, I just kind of wanted to give you an idea of what it looks like. So these are young cup locks, um, and this is just in the, um, the Okanagan area. And um, yeah, we just downloaded this from the Data BC website. This is publicly available information. Um, and so yeah, so this is young cup locks on the landscape. Um, these would be uh, medium aged cup locks, 13 to 40 years old, um, old cup locks. And then I thought that everything 
thing here had been cut, but I was wrong. There is still some unharvested forest out there. And so this is everything that hasn't been cut um, according to the remotely sensed um, uh, cut block layers. And so I should mention that all of these layers are probably a little bit wrong, um, right? Nothing can be down to the exact meter, but I think at a large scale, um, they actually seem to do pretty well. Um, and then, um, yeah, so we also have young burns in there. So these are the young burns in the area. Again, we don't have too many of them here. If this was a map of Cache Creek, you would see the whole thing would be red because of the Elephant Hill wildfire. And then, yeah, old burns as well. And again, um, there aren't that many old burns on the landscape just because we've done a really good job at um, stopping these fires from occurring. And then, of course, our road layer. Um, again, just this has gotten, this was um, downloaded from the Provincial uh, Data BC website. And then when you put all of these things together, this is what it looks like. And you can see that in this portion of our study area anyways, I've kind of covered most of the ground pretty well um, with a couple of, um, yeah, grasslands uh, notwithstanding there. Um, and then what we do is we put the GPS locations from the deer on top of these layers, and then from them we can extract all the different habitats that they're in. So I can tell whether each point, whether it was in an old burn, young burn, no burn, um, and then um, the different ages of cut blocks, how far it was from a road, and then that kind of thing. And then what's neat is that um, in as well as downloading these habitat layers, I also downloaded um, different weather layers as well. So I um, these layers are just modeled. So this is maximum daily temperature modeled um, for May 2018. May 28th, 2018. Um, and the reason I decided to go this route um, was because if I just use the more traditional weather station data, um, there's only like five weather stations across the three study areas. And so it doesn't really pick up that variability that exists in terms of where our deer are spending time, right? Every deer in the Okanagan would receive the exact same snow depth or exact same daily temperature, which wouldn't really be accurate for a deer living in a Soyuz versus a deer living in, the, um, you know, like uh, near West. Bank. So I use these maximum daily, these um, different modeled uh, temperature and weather covariates. And what's also neat about these is we can line them up to the exact day um, that a deer was there. So this is for May 28th, 2018. And then we can take the locations for the deer that existed on that day and extract the temperature variables for that day specifically. And we can do this for all of the different um, weather variables you can think of. Um, one important one, again, is snow depth. And you can see the darker blue colors are higher snow depths. And then it's, um, it's lighter blue down here by the lake and this is lower elevation so we would expect lower snow depths there and it's also where a deer um, spend a lot of time and so this is January 11th and here we are February 15th you can see that the snow depth has increased um okay so we know that habitats used at different time scales can impact survival. That's a really important thing to understand and remember. And um, it turns out if you measure something or habitats at too short of a time scale, um, you might come to the wrong conclusion. And so I like to relate this back to people just because uh, it's easier for me to understand. So if we think about this in terms of a person, um, you're trying to figure out why uh, or where people die, what habitats people use um, that leads them to die. If you look at this at too short of a time scale, scale, you'll probably come to the conclusion that hospitals are extremely dangerous places to die or to, to be because that's where most people end up dying. And we know that this isn't really true, right? It's that people were sick beforehand, they went to the hospital, and then they died. And so really, for this type of question, we need to be looking at a bunch of time scales. And so for people, we might want to know like, okay, did this person spend time in smoking areas? Uh, did this person only go to the hot dog section of the grocery store, and that's all they ate? Or did this person also go to the produce section and then they eat, ate a couple of um they ate some watermelons or different fruits um and then yeah where did this person live for most of their life did they live in a really dense congested city with air pollution or did they live out in the country um and things like that so there's just like a bunch of things to consider and using different time scales is really important so with this in mind, I'm trying to yeah incorporate this into my survival models. I used two different time scales. So the first was my short time scale, which was two days, and then my long time scale, which was 30 days. And so what I did was I summarized these habitat variables on a two day and a 30 day time frame. And so I started on the day that the animal died, and then I summarized the habitats that they used within those two days, and then moved backwards from there. Um, 
or I did it on a 30 day time scale where again, I started on the day the animal died and then summarized the habitat variables over that entire 30 day period. Um, and just as a note, um, most of the neonates, uh, a lot of the neonates had died before 30 days was up. So I, they only have a two day time scale. Um, so there's only results for the two day time frame for the neonates. And then, yeah, so I summarized these variables over those different time scales. So we have um, average road density, average distance to road, average weather variables, and then the proportion of locations within each disturbance type or age class. Um, and then the way the model works is that it compares the variables used at the time that a death occurs to all the variables used by a live deer at that exact same time. And so in this way, what the model tells us is that it's habitats used within two or 30 days of death that might increase or decrease their relative risk of mortality. Um, yeah, so the model I used is called the Cox Proportional Hazards Model. Um, and that's not really that important, but the main thing to know is that one of the main assumptions of this model, right, every model has assumptions, but the main one is that the effect of the variable does not change over time. So if um, road density is bad for mule deer early in the summer, it should have that same effect late in the summer. And so what we wouldn't want to see was this kind of change over time. Um, but it turns out this does happen, right? Things change over time. You can understand how that might be possible. And so it just means that I have to um, model things a little bit differently and then the results come out a little bit differently, um, but it's still valid. It, you just have to like incorporate it into the model. Okay, so then for neonates, um, there are a few things that are non-habitat related that we know can impact neonate survival. And this is from literature and other or studies done in other regions. Um, and so these include things like birth mass or sex, uh, the date of birth even, or the movement strategy of the mother, whether she was a migrant or a resident. And so I really wanted to include these variables as well, because it's possible that neonate survival have, really has nothing to do with the habitats they're in, but rather rather um, what weight they were born at. And then I think that's important to, to get at as well. So I ran a separate set of models that just looked at the effect of these, what I call intrinsic variables um, on neonate survival. And yeah, before I get to the results, I just want to throw out a couple caveats about survival modeling before, yeah, before we get to the results. So just things to think about. And the number one thing is that modeling mortality risk and survival is incredibly complicated. Um, we know from looking at um, studies that look at people, uh, like what our risk of mortality might be from different things. We know that it incorporates, you know, not just what you do, but what your mom did, where you grew up, where you were born, like your genetic history, all of these things are um are important and can affect um, whether you live or die. And um, yeah, so these models are the same ones that scientists use to determine the effects of different things on human survival. But the thing is, when people do these in a clinical setting for people, they often choose a group of people that are the same gender um, and the same age class. Uh, they might all weigh the exact same. Uh, they're all non-smokers. So all of these things, they try to pick people that are alike in pretty much exactly the same way. Um, except for one variable that they're interested in studying, and then they look at how um, that one variable might impact survival, right? But we can't do that with deer. All we do when we catch the deer, we just catch them in one study area that's geographic. It's similar, and they are probably all a similar age and definitely the same um, sex, um, but we can't account for any of these previous things. They're all unknowns. We don't know about the deer. Um, anyway, so this is just a long-winded saying of being, of just saying that modeling survival risk is really complicated, um, and uh, this is just one piece that that might be impacting deer survival, but certainly there's lots of other things that I couldn't include here um, that might also be impacting their survival. And then another thing to, to remember is that if a habitat type does not come out as significant in these models, it doesn't mean that it has no effect on survival, right? So just because it doesn't show up doesn't mean it doesn't matter. It just means that from this data set, we didn't have enough data to support um, tying it to survival. And perhaps with uh, more data, so more years, things might come up um, that show uh, as impacting survival. Um, or if you just model things differently, you might pick up on different thing. So just another reminder, yeah, just because I don't mention something as impacting survival uh, doesn't mean it's not important. Um, it just means I didn't find an effect of it. Okay, so let's get to our results. Um, what habitats are associated with mule deer mortality risk? 
And so this is fawns in the winter at the two day time scale. Um, and so um, you'll see a lot of these plots moving forward. So I'll just explain them. Um, what this figure tells us is that um, the closer you are to roads, um, the higher your mortality risk. So in this figure, um, it compares, it's the relative risk of mortality at differing values of the um, distance to road compared to a deer at this mean value, which is 286 meters. And so what this figure tells us is that a deer that spends um, at a two day time scale spends its time only five or 10 meters away from a road, it is almost has almost twice the mortality risk of dying compared to a deer that's 286 meters away from a road, which is the average. And then on the other side of this, we could look at and say, okay, a deer that spends its time about a kilometer away from roads in the winter at this time scale, um, it is has half the mortality risk compared to a deer that um, spends its time, again, 286 meters from a road. So bonds in the winter, um, being close to roads is bad for you. Yeah, and so just to clarify, again, above the dash line at one increases your mortality risk, so it's bad for you. And then below this dash line at one means it reduces your mortality risk and it's good for you, or better for you, I should say. So that was fawns at the two-day time scale, and then fawns at the 30-day time scale, I found that it was actually mean snow depth that increased their mortality risk. So this here shows us that as snow depth increases, their relative risk of mortality is also increasing. So in this figure, we could say that a deer um, that spends its time in an area where uh, snow depth is about 50 centimeters at a 30-day time frame, so it's quite a long time frame for the snow depth to be 50 centimeters, um, we could see that it has um, um, about twice the mortality risk compared to a deer that's um, has a mean snow depth of, I think that's like 18 uh, centimeters. So snow depth's not good for fawns in the winter at a longer time scale. And then for adults in the winter at the two-day time scale, um, I found something really similar to fawns at the two-day time scale in the winter and that roads were bad for deer. So this is road density, so a little different, not quite distance to road, but road density. Um, and you can see that as um, deer spend time in places with more roads, they have a higher risk of mortality compared to this deer at the average road density of two and a half kilometers per kilometer squared. Um, and it turns out there's a plot twist to, the, this, to this, though, uh, that's kind of complicated, so bear with me. Um, but it turns out that the effect of road density um, depends on the amount of unharvested forest that deer are in at this time frame as well. So this is the relative risk of mortality for deer at these different road densities if they spend about half of their time in unharvested forests. But what happens if we change the amount of unharvested forests that they spend time in? Well, at higher densities, so these are higher road densities, three and a half to five um, kilometers per kilometer squared, we can see that um, at higher road densities, if a deer spends no time, so this green um, bar, if it spends no time in unharvested forests, they have a higher relative risk of mortality compared to this deer that spend about half of its time in unharvested forest. And to me, this makes sense in the winter, right? If you think about it, we would expect deer um, to spend time in unharvested forests because again, it's catching that snow and creating lower snow depths. Um, so this makes sense to me if you've got lots of roads, perhaps that means you have predators as well. And so it's better for deer to spend time in places where um, there is uh, more unharvested forest and so um, shallower snow depths. But the tricky thing is, and something that's jumped me for a while, um, is that at lower road densities, here you can see this is zero to three kilometers per kilometer squared, it turns out that it actually lowers your relative risk of mortality to spend time not in harvested, unharvested forests, excuse me. So we see the opposite effect at lower road density. So lower road densities, it actually increases your relative risk of mortality, right? This um, purple bar is above the green bar. And we can see that, um, yeah, if you spend more time in unharvested forests at lower uh, road densities, it actually can increase your risk of mortality. And that stumped the heck out of me for a really long time. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. I can't tell the people this, like, why would, um, why would unharvested forests all of a sudden be um, be bad for you? Uh, but then I started thinking, where does this exist, right? So this is mule deer on their winter range, um, where we 
don't have a lot of cup blocks. So it's not like this is saying that cup blocks are good for you because it's not, it's unharvested forests. So where might deer be spending time where there's not a lot of unharvested forests and where there aren't a lot of roads? And it turns out that a lot of our study areas actually, especially in their winter ranges, um, have this grassland habitat or sagebrush or um, yeah, just um, shrubby areas that are not treed and therefore weren't included in my models. So you remember that this um, greenish blue, that's unharvested forest, the purple is cut blocks, and then these are roads. And so we can see if we're looking at an area that has low road density and is not in unharvested forest, we can see that it's actually kind of right here, right, on these open um, grassy hills. And a lot of these hills, we wouldn't be too worried about um, deep snow uh, because these are low elevation winter ranges. And so maybe it is better for deer to spend time in these more open habitats at lower elevations um, in their winter time because they can see better, uh, they can run away better than perhaps they could in a in a dense um, unharvest or a harvest unharvested forest. Whoa, sorry, excuse me. Okay, so that just shows kind of the nuance in some of these models and why at first glance sometimes they don't always make a lot of sense. But when you really think about what's going on and what you actually measured versus what's on the landscape, um, things can change. And I think that's really important. To remember. So, right, I didn't include anything about um, grasslands or, uh, yeah, non treed areas. And I think uh, moving forward, this could be a really important thing to, to focus on in winter ranges. Okay, so let's move on to adults in the winter at the 30 day time scale. Um, I found that similar to um, fawns at the 30 day time scale, that mean snow depth really um, impacted their survival. Uh, but this is one of those models where there was an effect of time. So we can see here our x axis now is time. And we can see that early in the winter, um, there's really no effect of snow depth on these deer survival, right? This crosses the dash line at one, our confidence intervals. But as we get later into February and March, we can see that our mortality risk has increased. It's above one. And so this is a mean snow depth of 23 centimeters. And if we compare this to a mean snow depth of 40 centimeters late in the winter, we can see that these numbers on the y-axis have really changed quite a bit. So again, snow depth increases our mortality risk, but really only in late winter for adults. And then for adults in the summer at the two-day time scale, I found that young burns reduce their risk of mortality. So this figure shows us here that in the summer at the two-day time scale, if a deer spends no time in a young burn at all, it has almost 1.5 times the mortality risk compared to a deer that spent about 25% um, of its time or 25% of its locations uh, within a young burn. And then the more young burns it uses, um, this relative risk of mortality decreases compared to this median value. And then I also found in the summer that young cup blocks also reduce their mortality risk. So it's pretty similar. Again, if a deer spends no time in a young cup block, um, we could see that it has 1.5 times the mortality risk compared to a deer that spent about 22% um, of its time um, in a young cup block. And then for adults in the summer at the 30 day time scale, I found that young cup blocks reduce their mortality risk, but only early in the summer. So again, this is another one of those plots um, where we have time on the X axis and you can see, so this green bar again is using zero cup blocks and this bar down here is using some cup blocks. And you can see that using no cup blocks early in the summer increases their relative risk of mortality and then it decreases as time goes on. And same with the effect of um, young cup blocks, right? So they're really only different from each other early in the summer and not so much late in the summer. And then for neonate survival, if you remember, I talked about some of those intrinsic variables that I wanted to measure. And what I found from that analysis was that male neonates and those born to migratory mothers had a higher mortality risk compared to female deer and those born to resident deer. And so if we look at what this looks like on a figure, we can see here, this is a bit different, but this is cumulative survival over 12 weeks. And we can see that um, for resident deer, that's the top color. Uh, survival over that 12 peak period is higher than for, um, for migrant deer. And then again, these curves for the males go a little bit lower than the curves for the females. Um, the male-female thing is not um, super, it wasn't it was significant, but it wasn't the most significant, but it does trend in that direction. Um, and we see more support um, for the, the migrant versus residents um, thing. 
And then, yeah, for neonates at the two-day time scale, um, the only time scale that existed for them, I found that it wasn't so much habitat use that impacted their survival, but rather um, temperature. And so I found actually that as temperature increased in the summer um, at the two-day time frame, that reduced their mortality risk. So we can see that early in the, um, or excuse me, a deer that spends time or was born in an area where it's only 11 and a half degrees Celsius, um, it is has more than twice the relative risk of mortality compared to a deer that lives somewhere where it's a mean um, temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. And then as the temperature increases, um, that relative risk of mortality decreases. Okay. So what conclusions or recommendations could we make for this from this work um, moving forward that might increase uh, mule deer survival? And so the first thing we could say is that reducing road densities could reduce the mortality of adults and fawns in the winter, right? We found that effective road density in both adults and fawns at that two-day time frame in the winter. And we don't have any direct mechanism behind this, right? I don't know exactly why those roads might be decreasing um, mule deer survival um, because deer aren't really getting hit on those roads. They're not plowed, uh, so people aren't really driving them, and it's not very often you see a deer collision uh, with a snowmobile. Um, but what we might say is that perhaps it's those predators using those roads, and so perhaps it, that's the mechanism behind these roads being um, riskier for deer. And then I found that at a longer time scale, it was really snowed up that increased their mortality risk. And this isn't really that surprising. We've heard this before, that in winters where you have lots of deep snow, um, that that has a negative impact on mule deer. And we found that as well in this study. And then I also found, or another conclusion we could make, is that increasing young burns, um, especially on summer range, could reduce the mortality risk of adults. And again, we don't know the exact mechanism behind this. We didn't go out there and measure um, the nutritional quality of these young burns, but we could theorize from what we know from previous literature that, uh, yeah, it's, it's just better quality food in a young burn compared to an unburned area. And so because we removed this canopy, so lots of great growth is coming up underneath. And then I hesitate to, um, you know, recommend that we cut more things out there, but it did seem that using young cup blocks reduced mortality risk in the summer as well. And um, this, yeah, again, is probably the same reason um, that burns would be good for deer. And it's because we've removed this canopy. And so we're promoting this growth of understory um, that is good for deer. And then, yeah, for the neonates, this is kind of a funny one. I found that male neonates had a higher mortality risk than females. And at first glance, this really makes no sense because if one of these deer was a female and one was a male, I don't know that you could tell the difference, right? So how are predators telling the difference? But it turns out we're not the first people to find this. Um, and actually I found this before on my master's project. So this is from a paper I published in my master's in which I found in neonatal deer um, in Missouri, I also found that females had higher survival than male neonates. And people theorize that this is because males are more, um, active and they move more and vocalize more. And so perhaps that's why predators are keying in on them more than um, more than females. Yeah, but we don't really know. But anyways, it's just interesting. We aren't the first people to find this. And again, I found this in a completely different system in Missouri. And then another thing we found was that neonates born to migratory mothers had a higher mortality risk than those born to um, resident deer. And I think a lot of this has to do with, I mean, just the inherent differences between where migratory deer go and where resident deer live. So this is a neonate born to a migratory mom, and you can tell it's at, well, you can't tell from this picture, but it is at higher elevation, which might mean colder temperatures. You can see um, there's been a lot of logging activity in this area. Um, at these higher elevations farther away from towns, we might also suspect that there's more predators. And so there could just be a whole bunch of things going on in the land landscape in these higher elevation areas where deer move to um, that are worse for deer. And then if we compare this to, um, this is a resident deer uh, neonate that was caught in the Okanagan, and you can see this little deer just plopped itself right next to somebody's fire pit, and you can see like a fence and, and somebody's house kind of in the background. And so this could be kind of more of that human shield idea where, you know, it's born on someone's backyard, basically, and so there might be lower predator densities in these um, resident areas. 
And then our last conclusion we might come to from the um, other survival modeling work is that neonate survival might be harder to increase just through management alone. Um, and that's because we found that it really had more to do with the temperature um, than uh, the habitats they were in. And so this makes sense because there were times we did catch neonates when it was there was still snow on the ground. I remember one day it was 11 degrees and raining, and I could see why that might be bad for a small deer that's pretty bad at thermoregulating. And so perhaps from this we might say if there's a summer where there's a really late spring and it's still cold and wet up at especially up at those higher elevation areas um, we might suspect that neonate survival might be lower that year okay so with that I am done um, and I just want to acknowledge all of the people um, and organizations that given have given us money and time to do this work um, we're really super appreciative of them um, we couldn't have done it without without all these people and then I'm sure you all know this by now but we do have a documentary on YouTube called Community for the Wild it's really excellent um, and I think you should check it out if you have not um, yeah so I guess I can take any questions um, yeah Awesome. Thanks, Chloe. And uh, for the folks there in the Q&A function, you can put your questions. If you're coming in from uh, Facebook, you can put them in the comments. And just to kind of tie this together, Chloe's kind of doing the, the GPS collar movement survival habitat selection piece. And then Sam Foster, our other PhD candidate who's at University of Idaho, He's the one doing all the camera work, which is going to look at, um, you know, relative uh, abundance of predators and the different kind of uh, species and communities and also looking at roads. And then the, the next stage after that is having someone tie Chloe's data with Sam's data to help us understand what's really going on in the landscape. Um, and I guess the only pieces that are missing after that is really the veg piece and the nutritional uh, digestible energy and protein question. So we're, we're zeroing in. Good science takes a long time. Fortunately, we've got some really smart people giving us as much information um, as they can out of these callers. And uh, as Chloe said, we've continued collaring uh, after what we were going to uh, stop the project date to continue to kind of collect that, uh, that data. So if you have questions, I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A here, which is surprising, uh, but there's a lot to digest. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But since it's being recorded, you can go back and watch it on YouTube and you could send me an email uh, if you have thoughts uh, moving forward. Yeah. Okay, and so here we go. Here's a question. So this long winter may have devastated the fawn population. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I wouldn't say devastated, right? We saw certainly lower survival in the Okanagan region um, than the other two. It was 43% versus like 55 and 60%. So I think, yeah, it definitely had an effect, particularly in the Okanagan region. Why it didn't show up in the other two, I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say devastated. Maybe locally, there might be small pockets where snow depths were crazy high and, and maybe a lot of those fawns died. But I think over a larger area, it seemed Seems, yeah, in some places, survival was certainly lower, but I don't think it was catastrophic or the lowest of all time, but definitely um, lower survival than in a, a, a winter with less snow. Yeah. And the question, I don't know if you spoke about this, so the question about this winter in specific uh, in the west side of the Okanagan, so snow depth, longer winter, but our, you know, most of the mortalities were cougar mortalities. Were you seeing different predators filling those voids this winter in the west side of Okanagan? Yeah, in the West Okanagan this year, our actual, our number one source of mortality for fawns was coyotes and not um, cougars. Yeah, so that was kind of different too this year. Um, yeah, way more co or coyote predation than in previous years. And again, why that is, I really don't know um, and would be something that hopefully the cameras out there could tell us something ab about that information. But yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was coyotes this year. Thanks. Uh, another question, have you found most fawns drop within a relatively narrow range of dates? And if so, has this been consistent from year to year? Yes. Yeah, so in the um, in the boundary and in the Cash Creek region, I found that they did um, have a much tighter um, dates of birth. So it really seemed like it peaked on June uh, maybe like June 3rd or June 4th was really the biggest pulse of being born. And then a couple on, you know, the one side of that and a couple on the other side, but generally in the boundary, I was home each 
uh, summer by like the the, the 10th, I think. I really wasn't there a super long time. Um, versus I think in the West Okanagan, we did, we also had more deer collared, but it seemed like it also peaked around that time, but we did have kind of more um, that seemed to give birth a bit later as well. Um, and whether that's a function of just having more deer collared or if it was just a bit more spread out in that study area, I don't know. But yeah, there was still a peak, but a bit more spread out there. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, is there a pattern that the deer relocate to during the fires? Yeah, unfortunately for us, maybe it's probably fortunate, but we haven't had a big fire come through where we've had collared deer at the present. Um, some small ones have popped up, but a lot of them were actually places where our deer weren't, especially in the summer. They tend to migrate into really like far spread out areas. Um, and, and none of those places happen to be where we had a big burn come through. Like even in the Skeechison fire that was last year or two years ago, um, a lot of our deer migrate through that fire and where that fire occurred, but none of them really lived there. So this is just my long-winded answer of saying, I don't know. We haven't been able to look at that um, because of where the fires have come up. But I think the longer we keep doing this, we know there's going to be more fires in the next couple of years. And so hopefully then we would be able to see kind of what effect this has. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Uh... Is the temperature data the only available data proxy for water availability or is water availability not an issue for neonates? Yeah, I don't really think it's water availability that's a huge issue. If we think about, um, especially in while in the Cache Creek region, they migrate really far north um, to about 100 miles. There's a ton of lakes up there. Um, in the boundary, it's a lot wetter where they migrate to as well. And maybe in the South Okanagan, in resident places, maybe there's a bit more water limitations. But I think there's enough water around, especially when the neonates are young, that I don't think water is really an issue. Maybe late summer it would be, but I didn't really look at that um but yeah i think it could be more just an effect of actual temperature right these deer are small and they can't really thermoregulate very well so if there's a cold snap it's 10 degrees and, and raining um i i could see why that could have a negative impact on them thanks uh what was the top predator in cash creek yeah, it's still cougars. Um, yeah, the there were more wolf predation up there than the other two regions for sure. But you saw we only had 19 total wolf kills versus, uh, what are we up to now? Nine, no, I don't know, a lot of cougar kills. So it's still cougars, yeah. Uh, are we seeing doe migration to the higher country to have fawns occurring at the same dates, uh, irrespective of snow levels? Could they be dropping before nutritional green up? Yeah, so that's certainly a possibility. The deer seem to migrate kind of at about the same time every um, spring. And it is possible that they are, you know, if there's a late, um, a, uh, a late summer, early, whatever, I don't know, uh, they could be that they get to those high elevation areas and there is still snow and stuff hasn't greened up. And I know, like I searched for neonates in the boundary way up the gable, um, there was snow on the ground and we knew neonates were there because we literally saw neonate tracks in the snow. And so that is, yeah, definitely something that could be happening. And especially with uh, climate change and things changing over time, um, that because could become more of an impact of deer are not waiting to migrate until summer has really fully started. Awesome. Uh, are there future plans to include more geographical regions in the study? Well, I don't know. That's not <laughs> up to me. Um, maybe, you know, if you got a keen biologist in your region that would like to join in, has got some money. Um, but for right now, we're sticking with these three study areas. Um, but yeah. Uh, that one was from Grant. So Grant, oh. the answer is not right now. But if we somehow find another uh, big chunk of money, I guess we could. But we're we're moving on to the data-driven action part of this, which is going to be putting fire back onto the landscape. So um, thanks, Grant, for the question. Uh, concerning mortality and road density, I'm curious what, su what suggests that people are driving more cautiously on forest service roads or how information is tamed re regarding traffic mortalities. I'm aware of several mule deer killed in vehicle incidents over the winter just up the road from me and found nearly a dozen corpses on the side of the road embankments after the snow melt. Could they just be less reported? So maybe just talk about when you guys, when you all go out and do uh, mort investigations. 
Yeah. So it is possible that it's just our deer that are not getting hit by cars. But we, when we get the mortality notification, we go out there and we try to see what killed them. And um, most of the deer that die in the winter that we have collared anyways, don't seem to be killed by cars. They're killed by cougars and coyotes and other things like that. Um, and they aren't really that close to roads. I have fond memories of snowshoeing very far away from a road um, to try and find out what killed something. And so, yeah, I mean, I guess I don't know for sure that people are not driving cautiously on these forest roads, but I'm just looking at our data in terms of what's killing these deer. We have very few vehicle collisions. There's only like nine total in the project out of about 200 mortalities. And um, a lot of those were actually in the um, summertime. Uh, and the ones that were in the winter we're like right on major highways and not out on these forestry roads. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, survival decreases with snow depth corresponding with late winter. Has overall health nutrition information you looked at yet? Can be expected that deer have depleted energy to evade predators by late winter. Yeah, that's kind of the pervading thought on what why that's happening. And we did measure um, rump fat on these deer, most uh, most of them, um, early in the winter. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have the resources or the manpower to go out there and capture them again in March and re-measure their rump fat. That would be ideal because then you could see how much it's decreased over time and what habitats they were using to see that decrease. Um, but other studies have done that. So that one in California that I mentioned where they... Um, uh, where they monitored mule deer survival for 12 years, they did measure rump fat in early March or late March, and they they found that that was tied to snowpack, and then yeah, had the biggest impact on um, female or on population growth as a whole. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, is it possible a lack of diet diversity is the reason we're seeing so many mule deer kills by cougars? Yeah. Um, or I wonder if they mean diet diversity from the cougars or from the deer perspective. I'm not sure. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, if we're thinking about this from a cougar perspective, I know Siobhan Darlington, um, my friend and colleague who's studying cougars in the region, um, she gave a webinar not that long ago, and I think she talked a lot about diets of cougars. Um, and she's just started delving into that, and I know she's got some cool things planned for the future. So hopefully that could shed some light into what cougars are eating. Um, and then in terms of the deer perspective, yeah, it's totally possible that um, the plants that are growing up, like when a couple of goes through, um, sometimes there can be a lot of invasive species that come through and those invasive species could be lower uh, nutritional quality than the native forage species. And so then that could make deer in poorer body condition, um, which could increase their risk of mortality. Um, but again, we can't, we didn't go out and measure that directly, um, but that, yeah, is certainly a piece of the puzzle. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, so this one, I uh, remember, that might be wrong, said it on the 2020 webinar, I thought I recalled black bears being a major cause, if not the main course and cause of mortalities. So that might be tied to the neonate stuff. Um, are cougars the major cause of mortality from this year's findings, or is this an average from all years of data? And do you have any ideas, evidence that might suggest why there has been a change in mortalities caused by predators? Yeah, okay. I think, yeah, if you're thinking about black bears, that was definitely always tied to neonates. Um, black bears, we have had a couple adults get killed by bears, but very few. And it's because bears really aren't fast enough to catch an adult mule deer, but bears are really good at catching neonates um, just because they don't move. And so that would have been... Um, I won't go back, but there's where the slide where I had, it was unknowns was our largest source of mortality and then bear predation was right under that. And we couldn't distinguish between grizzly and black bears, but like largely that's probably black bear predation. And then, yeah, for, um, I didn't really look at this year specifically exactly what the mortality sources were this year. Like I mentioned, we did have a lot of cougar, or excuse me, coyote predation for fawns. Um, but I think a lot of our adults this year were still being killed by cougars. And so I don't know, I don't think it's changed from year to year, but yeah, the numbers I presented here are just um, totals from the whole study and not just this year. Uh, so is it fair to say that there has been a consistent decline in mortality rates over the past three to five years and what can be done? I think, yeah. Uh, okay. So I think in the boundary region, we could definitely say that, um, not definitely, but I, I think we could say that the mule deer population in the boundary is likely in decline given that um, low adult survival is 0 0.77. That's really low to be 0 0.82, like at the minimum for a stable population. Um, and then the other two regions are actually kind of 
they could be stable in some years and then in because their their adult survival is about 0.85 which is kind of where we'd want it but i think in years where we have um larger overwinter fawn survival or we have lower overwinter fawn survival those might be the years where the population declines a bit and then maybe they get stable the next year and then another big winter comes through and then they decline again so i think in those the cache creek and the west okanagan i think maybe it's a bit more dependent on the year but yeah i think in um and the boundary it's declining and then in terms of what can be done about it i mean i really don't know that's kind of what this reach is, is trying to figure out if i could pick one thing to do right now and have somebody listen to me and actually do it and have the money to do it i would say let's start deactivating a bunch of unused forestry roads that we don't need um but yeah that's based on this research and and research from other places but again i who will listen to me i don't know we do <laughs> thank you <laughs> How far below optimal neonate survival rates are the study areas? Are there any relatable areas in the U.S. that would be comparable to BC that have experienced similar events and have been able to improve, improve mule deer recruitment and survival? Yeah, okay. So the neonate survival actually is pretty comparable to other regions. Um, I've never seen a survival estimate for neonates above 0.5, like ever. And in some places, it's really low. I'm trying to remember. There were some where I looked where one year it was only like 0.15 or something for neonate survival, which is ridiculously low. So ours were kind of not... Um, yeah, not in a bad place. And then in places where they have managed to kind of increase um, mule deer survival, it seems like well, in Colorado, they've done some habitat treatment. So there they have a lot of um, pinion juniper encroachment, like forest encroachment on these previously um, sage brushy habitats. So they try to do a lot of um, habitat improvement work like that to try and increase um, mule deer winter range. Um, yeah, and but yeah, uh, increasing deer populations is very difficult. Um, and so people try their best and in some places they manage to stabilize it, but to grow a population is, is quite difficult. Yeah. Without supplementally feeding them, but uh, yeah. Right. In Colorado, they saw that with supplemental feeding too, right? They yeah. They, them. yeah, they fed them in the winter and it increased. Yeah. But because of de disease concerns and things like that, it's really not a good idea to be feeding deer. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Chloe, very much. It's eight oh five. You probably had. You know, that's a lot. That's a lot of talking. Yeah. So we really appreciate everything you do. Uh, I'm sure your your committee and your supervisor does too. Uh, you've done a great work, a great job. Uh, we'll look forward to having you back again once you wrap up uh, another chapter, I guess, and then start tying things together. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks for Leap for taking care of all the technical stuff in the background. Uh, next one is going to be in June. It's going to be with Gail Wallen from the Invasive Species Council uh, talking about the impacts of invasive species on native species here in British Columbia. So thanks again, Chloe. Thanks, Philippe. Hope everyone has a great evening. Uh, and uh, Chloe's uh, information contact information is available anywhere you want to search chloe right and if you have yeah. questions for her <laughs> feel free <laughs> yeah it's chloe.wright at ubc.ca and hopefully the next time i see you all i will be dr chloe Wright and not just <laughs> regular chloe Wright. <laughs> yeah <laughs> awesome thanks chloe yeah thanks see ya